What is memory? We've got scattered about this guy with the, with the head kind of tipped open here. Is some suggestions or are some suggestions that have been made by previous pupils over the last few years. Some of them are quite kind of textbooky. So it's a mental process. Memory is a mental process. It's produced by the brain or it's a function of the brain. And again here, it's a process of storing information. It's a process of encoding information. And it's a process of retrieving information. We're going to look at all these areas a little bit later on. <clears throat> what about these two? These are a little bit different. It's our identity. Are we the product of our memories? Do our memories shape us? The past shapes us, therefore we must remember something about that which has shaped us. What about this? Our past, our present and our future. Our past and our present, fair enough. What about our future? Why should memory be concerned with our future? I suppose what they meant by that was that we, we can't plan for the future unless we know what's happened in our past. So I mean, it's, it's a perfectly good, good suggestion. Let's have a look at these three processes. These are three processes of memory. So we have, so we have this this idea of encoding, which we which we looked at before. Encoding. What could that possibly mean? It's basically putting information into memory. So if we think of information as data, so data or info into memory, it has to be stored in a particular way. And it's not always the same. What about this second one, storage? Once the information is there, it's got to be stored and it's got to be maintained. So we maintain the information in memory. And you'll be surprised to know that our memories really aren't very good. And information gets lost and it gets replaced with other information and it can be quite tricky sometimes which is where we come to here this idea of retrieval we've got to get the stuff back out of memory so we've got to have we've got to recover it from our memory or recover our memories and this is obviously important when you're doing exams and we'll all be aware of the situation when you're sitting in an exam and you think you know everything perfectly well and suddenly you realize that you can't remember anything or you can't remember the important things that you're supposed to remember. So it's not as simple as just retrieving information. So what do psychologists do about this? Psychologists what they can do is they can create models in order to try and understand how mental processes and memory is a mental process, how these function. And these are based on evidence because psychology is an evidence based discipline. And these can come from experiments, which we'll look at and we'll do a few of. And they can come from case studies, which are very detailed studies of a particular person or a particular thing. We'll have a look at some of those as well. What I want to look at in the next few minutes is a particular model. And this model is called the multi-store model. And it was developed by two psychologists, both named Richard. They're Atkinson and Schifrin. And this was in 1968. And it was kind of the first proper model of memory. This is what it looks like. 
Something's really strange is going on here. And this is what it looks like. So this is the multi-store model of memory, and it's a really simple memory, simple model of memory. Uh, what we have here is something called sensory memory. That's a very, very brief storage system, which just holds that information that is going into the eye and just registering in the brain. If we tend to those things, because we don't attend to everything, we don't see everything that's going on around us, and we don't remember everything that's going on around us. But if we attend to it, then this should, in, de in theory, go into what we call our short-term memory store. And if we rehearse this, so if we're constantly kind of rehearsing it, trying to remember it, then that is going to be transferred, transferred into something called the long-term memory store. Now, we can also retrieve that information from long term and that will go into our short term memory and that's how we remember things. However, the downside is that all this information can be lost. So it's lost through decay, so it'll just, just disappear really. Displacement, so some other information gets mixed up with other information and we can't quite recall which is which, like trying to remember a new telephone number. You always seem to remember your, your old telephone number rather than your new one. So we've got decay here and we've got retrieval failure or interference. That's because all the information that we're trying to remember and that we're trying to recall all gets confused. And we can't always remember it. What we're going to look at is this idea of how memory is structured. And we're going to look at the stages of memory. And we're going to look at also at things, things of capacity. How much information can our memories hold? How long can they hold it for? And how does our brain store that information? So let's have a look at short term memory. Short term memory holds about seven plus or minus two pieces or chunks of information. And we'll, we'll do some work on that. Seven plus or minus two. So between five and nine. We think of this idea as being associated with a guy called George Miller in 1956, who conducted studies into how much information we can hold. So how long can we hold that information in short term memory, probably around 30 seconds. And this was an experiment conducted by Peterson and Peterson in 1959. So here is the evidence supporting these ideas. Information can be encoded or stored in an acoustic sound based form. That seems to be the way short term memory stores it. And that was a guy called Badley in 1966. What about long term memory? It has unlimited capacity. We can just store loads of stuff in our long term memory. We're not sure how long it stores it for, but it's probably very long. And this was part of a study conducted by Barrick in 1975. Uh, and what about encoding? We think it's encoded in, in a semantic form that's based on meaning. And that is badly 1966 again. Same experiment as here, but his results were based on short term and long term memory. There are strengths of the model. This is quite a good model because it does distinguish between short term memory and long term memory. So there are differences in capaci capacity and duration and encoding. And also there are some case studies. HM was a man who was studied quite in depth by psychologists uh, because he had some damage to his memory. Uh, and we can we can look at his case study in detail. There's also laboratory evidence and particularly what we call the primacy and recency effect. This is the effect that we tend to remember things at the beginning of a list of words and the end of the list of the words, but the stuff in the middle 
tends to get lost, which suggests that there are different stores doing slightly different things. So when you're recalling that information, the first thing on the list will probably now be in your long term memory. The last thing on the list is probably still in your short term memory. So that's why you tend to remember all the stuff at either end rather than in the middle. Weaknesses, it's a very simple model. That's all. Can, you can also think of that as a strength because it's easy to understand. It doesn't take into account all these strategies that people use to remember things like mnemonics, um, like uh, visualizing information. Lots of people employ lots of different strategies. You may have used mind maps in the past or spider diagrams. It only focuses on the, in, on the amount of information and not the type of information. So you can probably remember song lyrics, but you can't remember what you needed for your maths exam or your history exam. So why can you remember song lyrics? So it's about the kind of information as well. And there may be too much emphasis on the role of rehearsal. I suspect you can all remember what you had for breakfast this morning. And you can remember that even though you haven't spent the entire day rehearsing it. So that's what we're going to look at over the next in, in the next lesson. We're going to do some work on this.